Thank you for joining us again in our sessions on English grammar. These sessions are meant to, meant, or they're ESL, so English is a second language for people like yourselves who would like to lift your knowledge of English, uh, which I'm sure be, it already is quite high, otherwise you wouldn't be listening to this. You'd like to lift it to fluency and perhaps mastery eventually. And our, what we're doing is we would like to help you to do just that. Today, I will be joined by uh, two wonderful leaders in, in the field of ESL. The first is Gail Vignola. She is a professor of English at uh, Seton Hall University, and she's also an administrator for Syrian refugees coming to this country. The second person is Rasha Ajalia Kim. She is from Syria and has had many years of experience uh, being a consecutive, excuse me, not a consecutive, but a simultaneous interpreter at the United Nations. If you stop and think about that for a minute, that's really a, a quite a daunting task. You have to have really, a, basically, you need two separate brains. Uh, my name is Dr. Stephen West. I have a PhD from UCLA, and I taught the Turkish language uh, at UCLA and at the University of Pennsylvania for 14 years. So please join us today uh, as we help learners to navigate through the minefield to get through to the other side of, of our fluency. Continue, Rasha, this so is let, so interesting. So let's go back. I started asking you that this student wrote, I have finished 18 credits. Mm -hmm. And he's talking about the fact that last semester, he finished 18 credits and he's going on now. He applied to the US and he will be uh, attending Smith College. So the way he's using it, where as you might understand it as it is right, but the guy just wanted to tell you that he finished 18 out of his 32 or 38 credits required for his master's. Yes. And therefore an Arab, a person who's thinking in Arabic is going to tell you, so the guy finished them. This is all what he wanted to say. And knowing our students, I know that this is what he wanted to say. He wanted to say, this is out of my way. Yes. And actually, uh, let me respond to that. That that can very well be the case. He fin he finished these eighteen credits last year. That is what, that's when it happened, right? Mm -hmm. But he's talking to you now. For some reason, he's having a communication with you right now about that. Okay. And that's the potential future. So he says, "Oh, I I have I've already finished eighteen units. Uh, it turns out I finished them last year, a year ago, but I I have finished them." And in the back of his mind, in your mind, now I'm ready for a, gra a graduate program, something like that. But we don't you don't have to say anything for the future. It's implied. Or put it another way, it opens the door to the future. And if you just say, I, I finished 18 credits, there's no future anywhere. It's all in the past. I, I see it differently, thinking in Arabic now. Uh -huh. I see it differently. I just see it as someone who wants to convey to you a piece of information uh -huh. about an action that started in the past. It was a task uh -huh. that he needs to tell me is over now. And, and this uh -huh. is not necessarily part of a future plan. Because exactly. why do I say that? Because there are verbs that happen at the moment that I don't feel lend themselves to a future potential. Right. And this is where they're going to get mixed up. I'm, I'm coming and I will come to where I'm coming from later on. But at this stage, I'd like to hear what you want to say about it. Uh, what, what I will say is that the, the future for a, a perfect, a present perfect verb, the future is not all, it's not locked in. It's implied. It's only implied. It's, ne it's never a real future. But, but it, it makes a good answer to a question like, uh, do you have a bachelor's degree? Yes, I, 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 I have finished my 18 units and, and now I'm ready for more. It's a separate sentence. It doesn't have, it's not in the verb itself, but th that is the only verb that opens the door to the future. If you say, I, 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 had, I took 18 credits last year, that's the end of the story. There's nothing more, no future. So what, so you took 18 credits. I have a question, Rasha. Did he say I have finished or yeah. I finished? I have. I have. So I wonder where he got that from because that's not that's yeah. not typical for typical an Arabic, Arabic speaker. Yeah. 
That's why I'm just telling you that if he used this construct, he used it by mistake, as they all use it. They know, they know about a tense called the present perfect or uh -huh. the past perfect, and they will they will push it into the language. Maybe because I asked, you remember the the first lady that I sent you, that she's she's my second cousin, a young lady just uh -huh. fresh graduate, and she learned English. I mean, believe it or not, the first the first lectures she took, she had to use a translator yes. to be able to understand her pharmacy lectures at an English uh, institution in Lebanon. Yes. So, so she wants to prove that she has the the mastery. She has the the she's flexing her linguistic muscles uh -huh. to say that I am aware of more than simple tenses. So yes. now I'm going to start. And when I asked her specifically for your sake, I said, "Why did you use that?" And she said, yeah. "I don't know." <laughs> if you want to imply something using the the perfect construct, and I can I can dig out her her first document that I sent you. Uh, it, you know, it, said, no. it, it it strikes me that someone a person like that feels pressure from English to use the perfect tenses without really knowing what they mean. Absolutely, and which, <laughs> is, which is exactly why I'm saying that I think if I were if I were learning you know and i wasn't exactly sure where i'm coming from uh -huh. and after all these kids think in arabic i'll i'll yes. tell you a joke about i just used with my mother recently uh -huh. mom you can't do that because i was just telling her my mom broke her hip and she would stand up without using the walker uh -huh. and i'm using you can't do that and the way she it translated into arabic map to idri she said i can because to her, she can simply do this and stand up. And I said, no, no, you shouldn't do that. Shouldn't, and you yeah. see how contamination starts working both ways. Yeah. So the same way that we are told as interpreters, which is why I told you about the joke of, of sitting on the council's table and everybody thought of the representative of the US or Nicaragua, whatever, sing, sitting and dangling his feet yeah. is because this is the contamination that ha happens. And contamination. Contamination, uh, exactly. And contamination okay. is not only in a word as in a preposition, but it's also in a concept. Uh huh. Well, let, let me just respond to what you said to your mom, because okay. that's that's very important. You brought in the subjunctive mood and that all of the verbs we're talking about are not in the subjunctive. The subjunctive is a whole world of its own sure. and the timing of subjunctive phrase, verbs is kind of loosey-goosey. You know, you say, I can't do that. That's, that's even subjunctive. I can, I cannot. And then you said, I, you shouldn't do that. So it's very strongly subjunctive. Well, the timing doesn't much matter. The timing matters intensely for the other 12 in the indicative uh, uh, verbs, that, which we're going to talk about. For, for the perfect verbs, the timing is everything. <clears throat> but um, I don't think you should, uh, the subjunctive, I'm, I'm going to, that's going to be a future session. And it, it's messy. The, sub, the entire subjunctive is messy because the timing is off the rails so often with the subjunctive. Yes. Everything it, is. <laughs> what I'm trying to tell you, what I'm trying to tell you is that the first thing that they taught us when I was going through my English language and literature uh -huh. class is that language is a system of arbitrary vocal symbols. Oh, yes. And when you use this, then it's not only the arbitrariness does not come necessarily from invoking a certain sound to mean something, mm -hmm. but it also comes from the cultural construct in which you believe that what your culture perceived as a way of expressing a concept uh -huh. is not as readily available to other cultures yes. or as automatic. That's right. And, and therefore in a learning process that you're trying to, to steer and, and manipulate in a certain uh, context of once one lesson about the tense uh, about the perfect past or present or blah 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 this one would have to take into account that you should not probably address the student's logic because it's illogical what i'm yes. trying to tell you is that it is not logical yeah. tell them that we as british as americans decided that this is the way in which our culture yes. expresses the notion of an act that has happened in the past, but has a potential of continuing into the future. Yes. If in your if your languages and cultures 
are not, you know, are not open to that, then when you speak in English, try to think the way we do and yeah. learn it as if it was just Japanese or, or yeah. Chinese. Right. And forget what forget what it really is, because, you know, what you, you said is so important, Russia. Languages are totally irrational. There's not one language on Earth that actually is rational. It's it's human. It's very, very loose. There's not one rule in the English grammar that is consistent. Not one. You can take every grammar rule you've learned and there are always exceptions. And sometimes it's way off in the boondocks, like the phrasal verbs and so on. This is true for everything in this language. It's, it's, it's human, it's human made. And so it's got its problems. But I, I really appreciate what you're doing because you're exploring that. You're exploring the, uh, the mentality behind um, what it turns out to be, in my, as I see it, the verbs of English, unlike the rest of it, unlike the rest of the grammar, the verbs are rather fussy. Um, yeah. You know, they, they, uh, and th there's a reason for that. It's 200 years ago that the British grammarians brought, put this stuff down in writing because until, until up to the 1600s, up until William Shakespeare, basically, the verbs were just a huge mess. And then, so there is this, we have this systematic arrangement, which now is pretty, pretty solid, pretty, pretty much accepted. Um, are there exceptions? Of course there are. But I think the thing um, about the perfect verbs, <laughs> it's, almost like a, it's almost like a dirty word, isn't it? The perfect verbs. <laughs> um, but I, the, why are we doing this? Why are the three of us here and, and Nigel's joining us? Why are we here? We're here because we're trying to take this irrational language called English and put a, a certain amount of systematic structure onto it, a certain amount of regularity. So, but what I'm saying is something you can count on. Why? Because you want your learners to be able to be fluent in English, to be able to talk to like your Arab friends, to talk to Gail and me and, 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 and not make a fool out of yourself with, with the tenses, you know? And, and the, the perfect verbs, like it or not, are, are pretty fussy when it comes to, um, let's, let's go back, if you don't mind, Gail, let's go back to that example you said about died, he, he died. That's, 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 you know, even when I, even when I read that, uh, I wonder if you, and I'm curious if you do this in Arabic, uh, I, if I, in Turkish, I can, I can say, Öldü, but that's hard and cold. It's just like he died is cold and hard culturally psychologically the word the word itself is just way too strong uh so you that's why we say he passed away or he passed or uh went over the rainbow bridge we do all kinds of, we all skirt all around it now later on in history say a year or 10 or 10 years later we can say oh you know uh teddy roosevelt died in the year so and so and it, as a part of history but right at the time and right when people are are aware of this person you cannot say he died. It's too strong. It's cold. Do you do that, Belarabi? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, we have to say it as it is. That's exactly what I like about that, believe it or not, that now you're changing how I felt towards the language. Uh -huh. yeah. I felt also that there are verbs that shouldn't lend themselves to be used with the perfect because of the future potential. Mm -hmm. And if you kick the bucket, there is no future potential. <laughs> you died there and then, and at a certain moment, as we say in Arabic, may, may you always be uh, you know, far from harm's way. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I have died. I mean, uh, my father has died. I mean, my father died. It's, and it's not a matter, I can, I can use, you know, I can, we yeah. also have whatever you want to say, but it's not because uh, we're trying to, to beat around the bush and to ha have a softer landing of an event. To me, death is once you, once a person, you know, has the last breath comes out, that's it. He's dead. You know, I want to ask you a question because um, I think that the, the Turks, you know, the Turkish uses a lot of Arabic. You probably know that. I know. <laughs> at, at one point is almost 60% of the vocabulary. So that if I say, I'll just show you the little comparison and maybe you can relate here. They say, that's, that's simply he died. Okay, that's cold and hard. But we can say in Turkish, 
Vefat. I bet you have something like Wafat. Wafat, wafat is death. Yes. That's, and, that's, and they turn it into a W, so it becomes Vefat. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what by using Arabic provides the uh, the soft landing. Okay. Vefat eti. That's a, that's more polite in in in, Tur in the Turkish world uh, instead of öldü. You can't. I just you can't say öldü. That's as hard and cold. Yeah. Anyhow, but but then Gail, you were saying, what about the future? If there's a, you know, he has died, and you could say, well, what there's kind of future here? Yeah, well, you look, he was. You said the suspect has died, I believe, mm -hmm. right? And so so this guy was a mass murderer, and there is a future. Maybe we're safer now because this monster's dead. Actually, yeah, but that actually was written by an an English speaker. The uh -huh. suspect has died. Mm -hmm. So I was curious as to why we why we try to soften it, like Rasha was saying, why do we do that? Well, we do, and apparently Arabs don't. Uh, we, 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 we have to, I mean, I can't, you know, I, 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 I can think back on times in the past, I just can't say she died, at, at, you know, right within the last few minutes after she died. I can't do that. Can you, Gail? I think I can. I mean, I, I don't feel such remorse. Um, <laughs> It's but I don't know why. I, I, I have to take notice the next time I talk about that. It's because I don't know. It's, it's harsh. In the culture, it's harsh. That's what I think. Okay. Can, I, I, can the, I ask a question, Steve? Can I yes, ask please. a question? Okay. So with the verb die, let's assume. Let's yeah. take that same verb. When you're telling me that, that the whole purpose or the whole glory of the perfect tense is the fact that <laughs> it leaves the door open to the future. Yes the door is open to the future of the object, not the subject. So if the suspect has died, the, the potential is for those who have survived him to, to live happily ever after now that they don't have to worry about a serial killer, let's assume, living among them. So, so that's something that maybe we start getting into so much nitty gritty things that the whole theory of we have perfected the timing of what started, when it ended, when it left the door open. So maybe we need to add here a layer of saying, mind you, keeping that door open is not necessarily for the subject of this verb. He yes. has died, mm -hmm. but it is. Uh, but everybody else uh, uh, lived after him. I wouldn't use uh, the verb. The, the perfect tense was the verb die because I think that it's something that happens once and that has no future. So okay. I'm wrong, and I'm glad that you, you told me that this is not necessarily the case. But that's something that I would like to probably build into, yes. or I would okay. like someone to build into an explanation, like the spiritual explanation of what it <laughs> right. does. Yeah, that, that's great. I, I, this is a wonderful conversation. And uh, I think that, you know, that, that particular verb is, well, it's the strongest verb in the, in the language, of course, because it's the end of the story. Uh, but uh, what the, you know, the, the, let's put it this way: the perfect, uh, a present perfect verb, does not always have a future. You'll see that in the examples we do tonight. Uh, I, 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 I have a, say, I, I have had, I have had many challenges across my life. Challenges. Well, I'm going to have challenges in the future too. So this is the only verb that opens that door to that possibility. So I had, you know, I had a challenge last week. So what? That's the end of the story. There's no future. We'll see that when we come to it. The the, uh, the handouts today. Um, I call them handouts. <laughs> Anyhow, I, I I really I really love the fact that you're you want to understand the psychology, the uh, the uh, you know the the backdrop, the spirit, the spiritual especially because that's the spiritual part of language because it is human. And human beings are spiritual, whether they think they are or not. I'm my opinion, and uh, so uh, it's wonderful. Please, 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 always bring your questions to this. Because... And she's a perfect student because many students, out of respect or whatever, um, are not willing to go further. They'll accept it. They'll say, "Okay, this is what the professor is saying," mm -hmm. but to question it promotes further understanding and discussion. Yes, right. So. That's what we want our students to do is to keep questioning.
Russia. So I, I was saying, I was saying that that maybe it's not to tell the student not to not to shy away from uh, having to ask questions, but to tell them not to try to translate. Try yes. to learn it the way you would want English to be learned, exactly. on its own with its own rules and regulations. Having to understand first the logic of how the English speaking. Uh -huh. uh, you know, persons, countries, whatever, have come to perfect their their the way in which they use their language as a vehicle of, mm -hmm. of self-expression. Yes. And how this is so much a matter of a cultural thing, even the way we speak, the the, the organization of the, you know, of our topics on, on how we discuss things. Uh, and then and then you you would probably tell them when you approach the perfect tense, please don't try to relate to your English. I mean understand the meaning in Arabic by all means, but don't use the rationale because once you inject that, you're going to be lost and you will never be able to use it the way this lesson is geared to teach you to use it. There is a purpose of after, you know, behind taking a lesson in learning English. And if, if for now, as far as I'm concerned, I have finished should not be, be a, a, in the perfect tense because I finished, I finished eating. Uh, I have finished eating when, that's another story. Uh, I mean, especially but, uh, as I told you, it's just used, sometimes it's just the negation. Well, let's just take your example. I have finished eating. Mm -hmm. That really it implies it's a fairly strong future implication because somebody said, well, are, are, you, are you done eating? Or yes, have you finished eating? Yes, I have finished eating. Well, let's go to the movies now. That's, that's the implication or you know, something after dinner. Why not I finished? So answer me. If I was your student and I said, Professor West, please, what, how would you explain to me the difference between me saying I finished eating and between me saying I have finished eating? Okay, very good. If I say I, 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 I finished eating, that's okay, simple past. Uh, like, so what? So I finished eating. So w w that's nice. So who cares? I mean, you just see what I'm saying? But if I say I have finished eating, that means I'm ready. First of all, um, let's back up on this conversation. Does somebody ask this person, have, have you finished? Have you eaten? How, how, what's the backdrop? What's the, what's the uh, context? Probably, probably, even if I was just calling a friend and saying, I finished eating, then I decided that probably I should go for a walk. Is it wrong grammatically to say that? No, no, it's fine. Yeah, that works. But if your if your friend says, um, "Have you finished eating?" or "Did you did you eat dinner?" and you uh, and and then and then you know that your friend would like to do something with you, go for a walk or to the movies or something. Uh, I have finished. That's done now. So we can go. I I get, I, I tell you what. I really love what you're doing because. What I think strongly that needs to happen is that learners, English learners, need to get into our brains. They need to think like Gail and, and Nigel and I think about actions, all actions, all verbs. And um, we, can't, we cannot get by without the perfect tenses. We just can't it's, because it's incomplete. The perfect tense, let me just tell you this, is, the present perfect is probably the hardest of all the verb forms in English, why? Well, it's because it can start way back at the beginning of your life. Have you ever eaten sushi? Or I say, uh, actually, there's a there was a dish in Lebanon that I just love, osmalia. Mm -hmm. You know what osmalia? Oh God, it's so wonderful. It's actually Turkish. Osman is Turkish. Yeah, sure. But yeah, so have you ever eaten osmalia? Well, that I can, you can go way back to, oh, well, yeah, when I was two years old, my dad brought me some Osmalia. That's a million years ago, but it's still included in that verb form. Up to now, have you ever eaten Osmalia? And, and so if you say, have you ever eaten? Uh, and I'll say, yes, I have. Um, and you, well, let's look, there's, uh, there's a wonderful shop. In fact, it was in Beirut when I was, I took my third year of college there. There was a, a shop across the way that made wonderful Osmalia. So I said, let's go. Let's go, let's have some Osmalia. That's the future. It's not in the verb itself, but the verb sets up the framework. That's what I think is an important thing 
it's a whole framework of, of a mentality, of a vision about action that includes the future, the potential future. Because the, the alternative to that would have been, did you eat Los Malia? Mm -hmm. And that just sounds wrong. Like it, it closes the door. Yes, it, exactly. Very good. But that's, but that's how I think because I, I'm, I've internalized this. But if I heard those two set questions, have you ever eaten or have you eaten Osmalia? Yeah, exactly. Compared with, did you eat Osmalia? Yes. Yeah, they're different. They're, they're diff they imply different yeah. potentials for conversation. The and the probably the perfect would always have to be taught uh, you know, against a backdrop of what is it that the perfect does that the simple doesn't do. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and if it is not presented this way, because yes. when you present it this way, you would have to show them that uh, you're, you're conjuring up the, the cultural context, the, yes. the, the, everything that you're thinking of at the moment. Yes. And that does not necessarily have to have an equivalent in your own language. Yes. So yes. this is how we think. Yes. And, and for us, this is the difference. Yes. And, and when you teach them the difference, then they will learn how to use it properly when they, when they use it. So okay. that they don't accidentally use it properly or accidentally make deadly mistakes. Yeah, that's right. So let, let me ask you, because you have learned it. You have, here's a, you have learned the perfect tenses quite well, haven't you? Isn't that true? Just say yes. I, I think, you know, listen, listen, I will never, I will never claim perfect command of English. Uh, I know that I read enough English in my life. I lived for 40 years in an English speaking culture uh -huh. and I have two layers of my English and I have two registers. Yes. I have a register in which I can interpret at the UN and end up doing something great. And I have a register in which I need to speak to the plumber and ask my cleaning lady to, to put the fitted sheet on the mattress. And then you, I would, I would be dispersed in 10,000 directions. So, so for when you are not, part of the, you know, when, when, in, when a language learning process does not come to you as you're going on with all the symbols of the culture and all what it means, you will never think of yourself as having perfected the use. And I see that with, with, with some of my colleagues who probably did not have that much of a command of, of Arabic. Uh -huh, yes. And therefore they make the same mistakes going into, into English because it just doesn't click. I mean, their yeah. prepositions are in a mess, their tenses are in a mess because they're thinking present perfect and wanting to, to, to use, I mean, trying to use the, the simple tenses in, in Arabic. And I, I told you that, I mean, I told you last time, I was and continue to be kuntu wala azal, okay? Kuntu. And if I interpreted that into English, I have been, uh -huh. the guy would put his earphone earpiece down and say, I was and still am, he will correct me. <laughs> Which is what it is. It's I have been. Yes. I was and still am. So, so what? So what? It, he's afraid of the present perfect. Exactly. Exactly. He wanted one clear cut past, one yeah. clear cut present, and this way it opens up the future to him. What What he's doing is is he's taking the structure, the stru the Arabic structure of verbs. Yes. And superimposing it upon Absolutely. English. Absolutely. And, and that doesn't work. I mean, Absolutely. that's he has to he has to get into my brain, Gail's brain, and Nigel's brain to get in there and say, okay, you people have a grammatical framework in your mind, in your brains. You you think of action in with these. You know, we learned these stupid perfect verbs when we were one year old. We didn't learn them. Our parents just used them with us, and we absorbed it, and we we were good with it from then on. But your Arab friend has does not have that life experience. It's not burned in there. So he has to artificially burn it in with people like you and me. Like, haven't uh, you learned your lesson yet? I mean, you would turn to your child and tell him, haven't you learned your lesson? Don't play with fire. You're going to burn your finger. That, that's a wonderful example because you say, didn't you learn your lesson? Well, that's, that, that's got, got no future. It will, exactly. Have, so uh, haven't, haven't you learned your lesson? I'm, an, I'm his, this kid's dad. He's been playing with fire for 10 years. And I told him every time, stop it, stop it, stop it. N those are the repetitions in the past. Haven't you learned? Duh. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. That that you could almost put the word "da" in there with a perfect tense. Exactly. That, you know, th there is a future, which is like now and tomorrow, for you to stop making fires. <laughs> so, so maybe, maybe from a pedagogical point of view, maybe the way to enter the world of the perfect with at least speakers of Arabic uh -huh. is to come with very clear cut examples like this. Haven't you learned your lesson yet? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So tell them if you were to express that in the context of an Arabic speaker, you would say, "You, I mean, it, you you burnt your finger before; it hurt you. You didn't learn your lesson, and now you are playing with fire again." So these four sentences uh -huh. would would be compacted into, "Haven't exactly. you learned your lesson?" Very good. That word "compacted" is is wonderful because the, the tense does that. It compacts all those experiences into one framework, one one way of viewing action. And uh, <laughs> you know, examples from with parents are probably the best because kids are always, you know, they they, they the repetition doesn't work. I mean, uh, <laughs> so I, yeah, I, you you can say I've told you a thousand times. Yes. Yes. That's another thing we say to our children. Not I told you a thousand times. Uh, I have told you a thousand times and I'm going to tell you again. Right. I, I told you a thousand times and I'm sick and tired of it. So now that I have told you a thousand times, stop it. <laughs> it's much stronger. The yeah. present perfect is much stronger because I, you, I told you. So what? The kid says, I don't care. You told, I know, Dad, you talk, do that. You talk to me all the time like that. But I don't really care. But you know, if I, I have told you, and if you do it again tomorrow, Gail, what are you going to say? If your your kid does it again tomorrow, what? You're going to be grounded for a week. Yeah. So how would you say that in Arabic, Rasha? Yeah, Rasha. I, yes. I have told you a hundred times. How would you? The simple, you, the simple past. Simple past. قلتُ لك مئة مرة. And that's it. <laughs> And then, if I were to want to inject the, the perfect tense into uh -huh. Arabic, and I will say it again today. Uh -huh. And this way, you're, you're telling them probably, and that's, I'm just, you know, thinking as I'm going, probably just telling them, this is almost a novel tense that combines the past and the present and leaves the door open to the future, which is what you said. Yes. which does not exist in Arabic. Yes. In Arabic, you, you said it in the past, you're saying it again today. This is the Kuntu wala azal. I have been and continue to be. You know, th this is wonderful because um, <clears throat> th this is this clear to me. Uh, th this particular tense, the present perfect, is the hardest of all the 12 tenses in English, by far. Uh, and it's because it has all of this, this, this structure, this framework that goes on and on and never stops. Um, that doesn't compute. It doesn't compute for Arabic. It's fairly clear, because when you said, say, kul, when you say, kullu something, it's all it's finished. Kul, yeah, yeah, like like kuntu uh, wala uh, azal. I was and still am. Yes. Okay. Something like that. But no, the example you what we were talking about uh, about burning your fingers or something. Uh, ah, okay, okay. Like like uh, uh, ha, ha, you 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 burnt your finger. Asbaat. Uh, so you burnt your finger again today uh -huh. and okay I, I missed that <laughs> okay okay so you you burnt your finger in the past uh -huh. today you put you stuck your finger in the fire again yes and you didn't learn that when you last stuck your finger in the fire you burnt it so you're repeating it today Yes, and, and you have not learned your lesson. You have not. Yes, yeah. and the, so that so you can even say that right then at that time if you're the parent, haven't you learned your lesson? Absolutely. That's when you need the present perfect. You don't, didn't say you can say didn't you learn your lesson? That's okay, but it's weak. It's it's not as strong. Uh, to 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 open, haven't you learned your lesson means. I don't want to say this to you again, dude. I've already exactly. told you a thousand exactly. times. Is it softer? Is it more emotional? Is is the first is is the use of the past tense 
more reprimanding or is it a matter of tone? Like when I tell him, didn't you learn your lesson? It's as if I'm telling him, what are you, dumb? You just, you you didn't and now know you're, I mean, where, whereas when I'm saying haven't you, I feel that there is an emotional appeal in it. Is it something that I am giving that without you meaning it or is it implied in the language as well? I'm just trying as, my, I mean, I'm, I'm being paid now because you're teaching me something that <laughs> probably my professor would have never had the time, let alone the knowledge to teach me. Well, you know, I, let, me, let me take your example. Let's say I'm, I'm, I'm a father and my son is, uh, I have one son, he, but he's not six anymore. He's 47. <laughs> but, <laughs> but okay. when, he was, when he was burning his fingers way back when he was a little kid, and I would say, well, come on, Landon, didn't you learn your lesson? That's a perfect time for the simple past. If, if, I, if that is to say, didn't you learn it? Uh, um, it's not as strong because he'll, he'll say, oh, I don't really care, Dad. I like to burn my finger. I said, haven't you? Now I'm going to get emotional. Haven't you learned your lesson, you dumb kid? You know, what's the matter with you? Because there, there will be consequences now. Exactly. And I, if and I say, haven't you learned your lesson? There will be consequences didn't you learn is over and finished just like you said in the past it's no longer uh it, it can be harsh that's true with with the emotion but haven't you learned is the has the big comprehensive broad picture of this action and that means if you do it again dude i'm gonna smack you <laughs> i don't know i don't know because a student can tell you no to me it's haven't you learned or did you didn't did you that's why I guess the best way to to approach it is is not to say that it's because it is you know it's <laughs> somebody <laughs> once asked somebody was asked uh, uh, okay you know tasala bihi wa tasala fihi called him in Arabic uh -huh. take the preposition bihi or fihi so, bihi wa fihi uh -huh. so we in Syria uh, I think we say tasalti in Egypt, they say tasalti bik, bika. Bika. And, and using the ba as a preposition not and the not the fi. Yeah. Not fi as in in. Mm. And I kept on every time he was doing the training with us as an interpreter, I would say something like tasala fihi. And, he, and, and then I asked him once, I said, and he would correct me. He would say tasala bihi. <laughs> I asked him one day, I said, Ahmed, why? Ahmed. And he said, this is what we say in Egypt. <laughs> because in Egypt we say so. Yes, <laughs> right. Okay. Actually, there yeah. is an element. This is where I think the arbitrariness of yes. the language learning process comes in. And oh, yes. sometimes you, can, you cannot probe any further and say, That's it's right. because this is how we think. Yes. And you're <laughs> learning our language and you need to learn how we think Yes. So that we can communicate better and we understand each other better. That's right. Uh, you know, uh, I just, yeah, there was an amazing article. I will forward it to you. It was, I think, in The Economist. Uh -huh. A friend of mine sent me today about translation uh, mishaps. And they said that the whole, the whole, I don't know if you've seen it, that the whole rush to Mars came from uh, the, the translation of channels uh, which were not meant to be like uh, deep trenches, but somebody thought that they are channels where oh. water ran. Oh. So people assumed that there is water, and they, they pinpoint they and they pinpoint that on a, a on an interpreter who came up with this and probably started the whole uh, exploration of that frontier yes. of Mars specifically. Right. I forwarded it to both of you. I think it's a very and yeah. I have. I will talk about it in private without recording about an incident that happened once in the Security Council that was yeah. outrageous because also of, of a misunderstanding. You can probably use these as anecdotal evidence of why should we be very aware of thinking the way that our interlocutors yes. think and using their language the way exactly. they want us to think. Uh, about using languages because that would the whole purpose of learning someone else's language is is communication and understanding That's when right. when this is interrupted in the middle of a process because of a rule of grammar then we're trying to kind of tr to get over that challenge you, you know you brought up syria and egypt you know it's it 
Arabic is a remarkable language in this way. There are at least 23 countries that are Arabic speakers. Okay, come on, 23 countries, get out, that's ridiculous. So it's inevitable that Syria and Egypt will have different, there really are regional, well, they, they can be different dialects actually. Uh, but you can always fall back on Fusha, on, on classical. We do, we do. That, you can, that's always available to you. That's very unusual. But if you say uh, Fihi in, in, uh, in, in, in Syria and Bihi in Egypt, that's, it just shows you how human language is. It's just, Absolutely. Uh, it's just arbitrary changes, you know? Uh, and some, and some people- Syrians, Syrians, for example, translate data into Mu'tayat from the Latin, from data, datum, to give. Yes. Okay, so A'ta in Arabic is to give. Yeah. Egyptians translate it as bayanat. And I said, what if a speaker says statements and data? <laughs> you're going to have to say bayanat wa mu'tayat. Otherwise, you're going to have to say bayanat wa bayanat. <laughs> you see? So, so sometimes, yes, the variations exist because of because our minds, and this is a perfect example. Maybe you can, one can conjure up the arbitrariness of, yes, there are rules. I'm sure that the Arabic Arabic language council, whatever you call them, I mean, I, now, now it slips my mind, has regulations for what you can and cannot say. Actually, you know, this is an interesting question. Do you, it is, it's a, uh, a it's a, a language institute. It's like the French. It's like the Majma al Arabi. It's like, yeah, it's Majma al Lugha al Arabi, a consortium type of. Where? Council, where, does it, where does it meet? Uh, I think they have one in Egypt and they have one in Damascus. Oh, so they're different. They have two. They have two, but to my knowledge, they coordinate things. Uh, and now the Arab League started promoting its own, you know, in an attempt to keep the language alive and 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 kind of adaptable to to new terms. We were discussing this today. I mean, I don't want to take you away from That's verbs. Fine. That's nouns, and we. That's all right. This this makes this makes for a powerful lesson, anyhow. You know, English. The English tried to make a language academy. Uh, the, the, it happened several times in London and several times in Washington, and it failed every time. Why? Because good, powerful poets said, get out of my way. I'm going to write this language the way I choose to. Don't be telling me what I'm going to use for a preposition or this or that. The French, on the other hand, are very sticky about, um, at least traditionally, about their language with the French Academy. Exactly. The Italians are the ones who actually started it. And, uh, but, you know, you're, there'll never be an academy of English because we're, because we're rebellious. We want it, we're off the rails. In the, <laughs> and that's why we're doing this very thing with verbs. We're, we're, because this language is off the rails, uh, you have to use it. And so you have to try to get a, to grasp it, to understand, to, to get a framework about it. And the, the best place and really the most important place to start are the verbs. That's where, that's where you can find some structure. Does it break down? Yes, every time it breaks down. But it, but it still is a powerful uh, indicator, a powerful sort of uh, um, assumption, set of assumptions for, um, for the most important part of any language, which is verbs. I wanna ask you this question, Rasha. Do you agree with me that verbs are the most important aspects or grammatical units in Bil Arabi, in Arabic. Sure, I do. You agree? Sure. Yeah, okay. And why? Uh, I mean, action is life. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Because action is life. And I guess nothing can go, and actually even, even the nominal sentence in Arabic uh -huh. is known to be much more softer. I mean, the landing is, is easier, but, but uh, what, and what, also what? we are, we are often objects, not subjects. So oh, maybe, okay. maybe you need, maybe we need to insert that layer, that political layer into, into the argument. But yes, absolutely. Actually, I don't think this subject and object make any difference with English verbs. Not really. No, no, I'm saying we as Arabs, as a uh -huh, nation, yes. we are, we are the objects of someone else's <laughs> action, not the subject of <laughs> so we rarely we can't you know we, we we're not allowed to kind of step and and, and be, be 
you know, exercise freedoms to do and not to do. Yes, and, and I think as far as I know, even especially because you have Fusha as a backdrop, as a sort of mm. foundation, you cannot stray too far from that, can you? you I mean, Fusha is almost like your language academy. It sort of holds... That's Absolutely. And it is linked to the Quran. I mean, yes. not that I would like to, not that I, it's not, it's not where I'm coming from, but uh -huh. I'm, what I'm saying is that there is a sense of betrayal. Today, I was talking to a friend about whether it's time for language, to, for Arabic to disappear. And I said, no, it does, it's not time for Arabic to disappear. This language is so capable of, of, of developing and, and bringing something beautiful and adding, it's not because I love it, honestly, but, but, and she said, but look at Latin, what happened to Latin? How did Latin disappear uh, by comparison to French and to, and to English? And I said, I don't know if I was to, to link that to the vernacularization of the mass, of, of mass in Lat from Latin to languages. Oh. And that, and she said, no, but I mean, people wrote poetry in Latin and wrote, yeah. Uh, literature but latin did not disappear not at all it it, it and french form 60 percent of all english vocabulary right now this minute all the words that we have said so far today are mostly latin or french latin through french sure. not english it's not english at all because that's and, a that's anglo-saxon it's very rude it's a and interpreters and interpreters are American and British counterparts used to tell us when you try to interpret into English, uh -huh. please use Anglo-Saxon words and not Latin French words. Very good. And to and why? And there's a wonderful answer for that. What's the answer? Why do you do that? Uh, is it is it less? Uh, uh, well, how how do we say taqa'ur in 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 English? Like I mean, not the not the sophistication in yes. as much as going that far. Well, that, actually, um, this, I didn't expect this to go into this, but I'm, the fact that you're talking about it, I can't resist it. Um, the grammar of English is entirely Anglo-Saxon. It's not Latin or French. We took thousands of words from Latin, from Greek and Latin through French, but that's superficial. That's not the grammar. We don't do any grammar of French if we can avoid it. Uh, what we, we fall back on uh, Anglo-Saxon. Anglo-Saxon are, the Anglo-Saxon words, as you know, uh, if you really want to cuss or curse in English, use Anglo-Saxon <laughs> because French is just too nice. You know, it doesn't hit the nail on the head. Yeah. I, could, I could give you more than you'll ever want to know about what I'm talking about. All the dirty words in English are Anglo-Saxon, really dirty. But, uh, you know, oh, French is just so sweet and, you know. <laughs> Anybody who has time to develop the, the subjunctive should not be <laughs> teaching anything. So I'm not going to take you there. <laughs> because you're talking about tenses, I hugged English when I, when I reached my uh -huh. proficiency level in French. And I said, who would want it? For God's sake, as an adult, I need to study si tu n'existes pas, dis-moi pourquoi j'existerai, so that I know if I got on a proficiency exam, how to put the subjunctive and what goes with what. Now convince me why, why the, the past and the future. <laughs> Existe pas, and si, si tu n'existes pas, existerai. Yeah, I, don't, so, I, take, I take the present perfect anytime. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the present perfect, um, oh my, well, we're going to come to that. That's our whole goal, is it, right now, isn't it? Um, but uh, all of the grammar of English, every, and as far as I know, this is 100%. Somebody will prove me wrong, I don't care. But it's a close to 100% of the grammar of English, the actual grammar, which is the, the structure of the language, is Anglo-Saxon. It's not French. I mean, we have these, we have the you know, pièce de résistance and... Uh, uh, you know, we, we have these wonderful phrases, but they come in as a, as a chunk, as a word or just a chunk, and they fit into the, the Anglo-Saxon structure of the sentence. Anyhow, <laughs> this, this is marvelous. But oh, I want to ask you, I got to ask you one more question, Rasha. How hard is it for you, because you have done this, how hard is it for you to get into the grammatical brains of people like me and Gail? And Nigel, how, 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 how difficult was that? 
think I make mistakes. I think I make mistakes and I depended so much on your kindness and, and, and accommodation that after all, I have jumped totally outside the context of my own language and uh -huh. tried to put myself in your mindset yes. and accepted what I was able to rationalize uh -huh. and, and adopt as part of my language structures. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know how it happened. In all honesty, all what I can tell you is that when I arrived in the States back in 1980, as a student of anthropology at NYU, it was a Middle Eastern uh, multidisciplinary program. Uh -huh. I remember that one of the, you know, at that time, it was a very prominent anthropologist. Binder, his name was probably. I know, I know the name. I think, I think so. He, he did, he did um, Kagili's uh, in, in Africa. My first, my first paper that he corrected, he said, one thing strikes me is that your English is better than all of the students, the American students who were raised here. And I'm talking at that time, I didn't have anybody to edit. There was no internet to check whether you're writing properly or not. So, I mean, he, he, he liked the paper that I wrote so much, but he gave me an A plus for it because he said that he thought, I kind of impressed him with what I knew. Yeah, I know. did not. I did not learn a lot before coming here. I had a, a degree in English literature. I had three courses worth of, of a master's degree at AUB. That oh, you was. Were, top, I that, was that, there too. That, yeah, yeah. I, I know you told me. I mean, so but that was stopped. My father is a graduate of the AUB, by the okay. way. That was stopped there because of the civil war. It was when the Karami mm -hmm. government fell apart. So I don't. I can't really claim that I was raised and and I learned English as a kindergarten to, to uh -huh. grade four, but then I joined the, the, the public school system. Yes. And I can't give credit to that public school system. I can only give credit to the fact that I felt confident enough to, to have always remained among the, the you know the the the, the achievers uh -huh. in, in class. Yes. So when you have the confidence, probably you keep on trying to push the envelope and, and, and to get with something better. To get and I, have to, I have to add something here that is very clear from what you're saying. You have done a marvelous job of objectifying both English and Arabic languages in general. You objectify, you, you have lifted yourself above Arabic on the one hand and, and now of English to watch your language. You watch yourself linguistically. Yeah. That, that's unusual. Most people just go into it without an awareness of what they're doing, but that object objectivity is the actual. Is, that's the gold about acquiring fluency and mastery. You know, I remember telling telling Arab ambassadors who were we were called upon to justify the mistakes of uh, as as a chief of the Arabic interpretation section, and I find that the best way of telling them who we are was to say that we are not mercenaries. We don't use language as you know, as a skill so that we can get paid. Each and every one of us loves this language enough to want it to come out to you and to be conveyed to you in as much as it is humanly possible for me to convey it. Yes. So don't sabotage my work because there <laughs> is a limit to what I can do under the circumstances. Yeah. I remember Fawaz, who Gail knows, once came to us as an interpreter. Maybe that's something that you can you can go with. He came to the to the class with props, and he came. He had a knife that he borrowed from the kitchen of the of the cafeteria at the uh -huh. UN and the red pencil, and I don't know what was the third tool. And he said, an interpreter and probably as, as a learner of language has to come always to, to, to his booth meeting with these tools. Yeah. One of them is a red pencil because as he goes, he needs to be correcting. Sometimes someone would tell you it's the administrative uh, uh, committee or and while it is called the consultative committee on ad administrative and budgetary questions. And you're supposed to discern from context that this is what he's talking about. Yes. Then you have the I was and have been. And you would like to convince your speaker that in English there is a better way of saying it. And it saves me two minutes. So instead of saying I have been, he said, I was and I still am. I'm already, I have been and I, I'm waiting for his next chunk to come in. So that's, I guess, these are tools. And, and one of the tools that a learner of language should come with is to stop judgment. And by stopping judgment yes. of 
where he's coming from and what he is acquiring uh -huh. kind of uh, clears the hard drive to accept rules that don't necessarily have to sound logical for him. Yeah. And, and just to take them and work with them. You have to jump off a cliff to, yeah. to, know, to know, know another language and, yeah. and know that you can fly. You have, you have to believe that you can fly. You gotta you jump can off jump the and, and, and pray that the net will happen because <laughs> many times one one other example of a famous interpreter in the English booth he said, avoid the arabesque uh, effect. And we uh -huh. told him, what's the arabesque? Arabesque. He's talking about Latin and and uh, Anglo-Saxon words. And he said, one of you would 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 try, for example, to say uh, 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 to ride a rough shot over blah, 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 blah. I mean, and that's something that they're very, very f fond of saying. And he said, while you're trying to say, ride a rough shot over, this is A, a tongue twister. B, it's too long. So you can say, it's not as elegant, but it's it's disregard, you know, say to, because he disregarded X, Y, and Z. Instead of that arabesque ballerina trying to do the arabesque and falling flat on her face, you can simply go with a little pas de deux and, and just, make, you know, make a nice exit. Not not make fun not not make fun of yourself. Yes. So maybe maybe that's that's also one way of, of approaching the whole language learning. It was, you know, I li I like what you said your your friend about a, a knife and a fork and a spoon. We're what we're doing is we're slicing and dicing the verbs of English. I mean, you're Gail, you're a cook. You cooked for a, a, a thousand people for a massive dinner not long ago, didn't you? Now who's guilty of hyperbole? wasn't quite a thousand well we, we 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 love we're we love hyperbole you can i don't care you can call say as many as you want but you but did. i was going to ask russia what the knife was for like you didn't explain the, the knife yeah, the the knife is to cut because their sentences don't end so the knives don't you know the knife comes to say well okay that's one idea that's another idea uh, i can cut the sentence i can because in interpretation if you keep saying this and that and his and her, you don't know who are you, who you're talking about. And therefore your listener would mix his verbs and subjects and who did what. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. so you cut and then you cut what's redundant because they would say al quwa was sulta wal unfuan and they're more or less the same. So at some point you probably need to say power, you need to say might. But but he wants to say three words. It's okay if you're in a hurry, just say two words instead of the three. You know, so it's probably this. And the other one was the red pencil to to correct. Sometimes you correct the speaker. Thank you for watching this powerful video we just completed on the verbs of English as they relate to uh, Arabic speaking English learners. That is to say. Uh, people who already are quite advanced in the, in the study of English, but would like to lift their language to fluency and perhaps mastery eventually of this language. And we focused on the verbs and the perfect verbs, as you well know, are really just a huge area of challenge. And uh, there were some, I, I was just quite amazed by some of the insights that we received, especially from our two other leaders in this on this video. In any event, uh, thank you for watching and do spread the word. Please tell your friends, especially uh, Arabic sp speakers who would like to learn English, have them watch this and uh, we'll, uh, and then we'll, and we will see you before long. Thank you very much for joining.